All right, everyone, how's it going? I'm back today with a special video. Now I'm here in the Robinson Woods in the Chicagoland area, sometimes referred to as Chichi Pinque Woods, and I am approaching a headstone to commemorate Alexander Robinson and his family. As you can see, it's a very forested area. There's a lot of deer around here. A lot of people like to come and feed the deer as well. You can usually see them around. But just to tell you a little bit about Alexander Robinson. Now, Alexander Robinson was born in the northern part of Lake Michigan, kind of around the UP on Mackinac Island. And the date of his birth is, for the most part, unknown because Alexander Robinson did not know his birth date. He was uncertain of it. So, historians have speculated different things. Some people have said that he was probably born in 1760. Others have said 1771. And still others have said 1789. Most likely the date of 1789 is the correct one. And he died in 1872, so he lived quite a while. Now, his father was a Scottish fur trader, and his mom was an Ottawa Indian. And he had learned the Potawatomi language, so he was quite fluent in that, as well as English. And his Potawatomi name was Chichi Pinque. means blinking eye. Now, one of the things that Alexander Robinson is most famous for is what happened in 1812, and that was the Fort Dearborn Massacre. Now... A war party of Native Americans had attacked the fort, and supposedly Alexander Robinson was there, and he was able to negotiate a bit with some of the Native Americans, and he was able to take the survivors of the massacre and put them on board canoes, and then he was able to send them to St. Joseph, Michigan, and then later Mackinac Island. And this was in 1812. And in 1814, Alexander Robinson returned to the Chicago area with a friend of his, an individual by the name of Olmet. And Olmet is the one that the Chicago suburb Wilmet is named after. If you can look right over there, you can see a deer right now. Like I said, a lot of deer. Quite a few deer. But when Alexander Robinson settled in the Chicago area, he opened up a tavern. And supposedly, this was the first tavern anyone had opened up in Chicago. Supposedly, he had the first one. And he also voted in some of Chicago's very first elections, and he was even an acquaintance to Abraham Lincoln. He also supposedly owned a general store, he had worked as a trader, and he did some farming. So he had a number of different professions. Now, he had married a woman in 1810, and in the 1820s, he took a second wife. Now, there's no evidence that he had ever gotten a divorce, so it appears that Alexander Robinson had just taken a second wife. And this woman was the daughter of a Potawatomi chief. So when her father died... Alexander Robinson became a chief as well. 
And he was a chief not only of the Potawatomi, but of a combined alliance of tribes of Potawatomi, Ottawa, and Chippewa Native Americans. So, now that he was a chief, the government approached him to try to get him to cede the land. And he negotiated some treaties. Supposedly he negotiated about four treaties between the years 1816 and 1833. And ceded a lot of land around here. And in honor of doing this, the government gave Alexander Robinson 1,200 acres of land. Some of this land is right where I'm walking right now. And they gave him this land. He had built a house here. The house actually remained until 19... 55 and in 1955 his descendants were still living in the house however they were known for their wild parties at the time and the house somehow burnt down in 1955 but yeah so that was what happened it's kind of difficult to find information on Alexander Robinson. You could find more information on his friend and colleague, Billy Codwell, otherwise known by his Native American name, Saganosh. And the Chicago neighborhood, Saganosh, is actually named after him. So... But yeah, Alexander Robinson very difficult to find information on him. You can find some things. You know, you can find some things in different books on Chicago history. Usually there's brief, you know, one or two line mentions on him. Never really a whole lot of information. I wish there was more. I know when he had a farmhouse right here in these woods, people used to walk through these woods from all over just to go to his house and have conversations with him because supposedly he had all kinds of really good stories to tell because he had lived through, been a part of, and seen a lot of history, especially of this land. A couple deer up there, as you can see. But, yeah, like I said, kind of difficult to find information on him. I have a picture of him right here. That's what he looked like. Usually he had his hair long, but he dressed in American and European clothing because he was a businessman and he felt that he should dress that way. But yeah, usually depicted as having long hair like that, kept his hair long. Now, like I said, he died in 1872. Now, the house, as I mentioned, burned down in 1955. Now, that same year, something else happened as well, and that was a murder of three boys. Now, what happened is these three boys had hitchhiked from downtown, and they were going to hitchhike to their houses in Jefferson Park. Someone picked them up, brought them to where he worked, which was the Idle Hours state horse stables in Park Ridge, and they were then murdered there, and their bodies were dumped in these woods. So, kind of a tragic story, and fortunately, at that time, there wasn't really a very close working relationship between the suburban police departments and the Chicago police departments. 
So the whole thing was kind of a mess, and it was difficult for them to collaborate with one another. Various departments were keeping information from other departments, and other departments were in the dark on certain things. So it was very difficult to find who had committed this murder. And the murder went unsolved until 1994. That's like 39 years after it had happened. And it was solved because there was an investigation into the 1977 Helen Brock disappearance. And when they were looking into that, supposedly they had found some evidence of an individual who had apparently bragged about committing the murders. His name was Kenneth Hansen. And Kenneth Hansen was charged with the murder, convicted, and he later died in prison. But there's more to the story than just that. Kenneth Hansen had an employer who owned horse stables as well, which is where Kenneth Hansen was employed. The name of his employer was Solis Jane, and he was kind of a corrupt individual. He had owned these horse stables in this area, and what Solis Jane and his brothers would do is they would go to the American Southwest, round up wild horses, put them on trains, bring them back to the Chicago area, and then sell these wild horses to usually wealthy Chicago people. And these wealthy Chicago people assumed they were getting great horses, when in fact they were getting wild feral horses from the Southwest. So there was a lot of other corruption on Solace Jane as well, different things he was involved in. And, you know, you could look this up online, quite a few different things. Did some other bad things as well. Now, another thing I do want to mention before I go any further is I actually have a picture right here of the original headstones that were here. Now, this photograph that you're looking at right now is this woods. It appears that there are less trees at the time. And as you can see, there's headstones. Now, these headstones were removed because they had been vandalized. You know, this is, of course, Alexander Robinson, and it's also his wife as well. He had... And it depends on the source, but Alexander Alexander Robinson had anywhere from 12 to 14 kids. So, some of their graves may be here. They're supposedly all buried here, the Robinson family. But the reason why they took the headstones down is because there was a lot of vandalism going on. These headstones were then taken out by the Cook County Forest Preserve District and placed in storage. And it wasn't until about a year ago, actually, that they managed to find these headstones. And I believe they returned them to the descendants of Alexander Robinson. At this point, they were in pieces, from what I understand. But, yeah, just... A lot of different things, you know, happened in this area, kind of as a storied history. Um, another thing, and if you do look into various paranormal books on the supernatural, some of them will reference this area as being haunted. They say that you can hear tom-toms, you could sometimes hear an axe hitting a tree, just different things from time to time. Sometimes you'll see orbs. It just kind of all sort of depends. And there's a famous picture. And I have it as well. 
This is the headstone that I showed you before to commemorate Alexander Robinson. And as you can see, right above it, there appears to be some sort of a, like, aberration. <coughs> but yeah, it appears there's like some sort of aberration above the uh, headstone. And frequently people will come in here with like ghost boxes and ghost equipment. You know, people that are into like paranormal researching. A couple deer right there. The deer are pretty tame actually. But yeah, I thought I would get a uh, picture because here's the uh, headstone and as you can see right above it there's what appears to be a white apparition you've got the headstone and then right above it this you know white apparition of some sort But, yeah, another thing I did want to mention is that there was a, another murder that took place here as well. <coughs> and uh, this happened in 1977. And it involved a girl by the name of Deborah Rosencranes. And apparently what had happened was... Deborah's parents were going to move down to Florida. She was going to join them in a few days, but she was staying with some friends. And while she was staying with some friends, apparently she had gone out joyriding with them. And a blue car pulled up next to the car she was in. She said she recognized the person in the blue car. She got in the blue car. Uh, she appeared to be, and her friend said this, she appeared to be pulled into the blue car. The car sped off and, you know, sped off. And the next time she was found, she was found along the edge of these woods, wrapped in a blanket. She had appeared to be bludgeoned. Sources usually say that it was a meat mallet that it hit her on the head, but I, I don't know how they differentiate that from, you know, any other bludgeoning object. But apparently when they found her, though, she was still alive, and she was taken to Resurrection Hospital, where she ended up dying 12 days later. At first they could not identify her, but later... Some people did come forward and identify her, but a strange thing did happen when she was in the hospital. That was the fact that a nurse had received a mysterious phone call of someone asking if Deborah was okay. And this was before they had any kind of identification on her. So, it was kind of strange that that had happened. Now, to my best of understanding... This murder remains unsolved to this day. And this happened almost exactly 40 years ago from the time of my making this video. So hopefully one day that murder will be solved as well. But yeah, I like making these on location history videos. You know, something I've been doing a little more lately. I find it quite fun. You know, rather than doing them in a room or a car. Sometimes sometimes I do like going out on location to do these videos. <laughs> I don't know how this video looked. You know, maybe it had a Blair a Blair Witch quality to it. I don't know. But I hope the camera's not shaking too much. <laughs> but, yeah, I hope you enjoyed the stories I had to tell. I know some of them were, 
not that cheery. But I did want to talk about, you know, the stories and the history of this area. If you watch this video, as always, I thank you for watching. Have a great night.